first of all, he bought the place, but the place was in a very dilapidated state because he had had to move out of Griba Castle in the winter because the roof leaked so badly, he, they simply couldn't stay. So they moved down on the promenade in Peel instead to Fernley and stayed there. And journalists from America visiting him in this, uh, which I suppose at the time was just an ordinary house, not a boarding house, uh, were full of admiration for the house because it had water closets. It was very modern. But then what happened was Mrs. Windows remarried a Mr. Jakes and moved to England. And because her husband, her first husband, had died without making a will, this place went to the son who was a minor. So there were guardians for it. But when he was coming up to full age, 21 years old, um, there was anxiety on her part because the place had been mortgaged for a thousand pounds and the sale price was about the same, but she was very anxious that the son should not start his adult life, life with big debts behind him. So she wanted to get rid of it. And uh, it came up in Chancery Court because of the minority of the son it had to be settled that way. And uh, when Hall Kane's bid for it was, which was 1,250, I think, came up the, the uh, judge sort of said, oh, that was a miserable sum or something like that. And the architect, the Manx architect, Cowell, stood up and said it was much more than the place was worth in its present condition. But then one of the custodians also said that they had advertised this place in local papers and in papers in uh, Great Britain. And Hall Kane's offer was the only offer they had. So on that basis, he got the place. But there was a sort of rumour or remarks on the island that he had duped the poor widow. And there was another reason for disliking him on the island. And I don't think that was at all fair under the circumstances. You find very few people who are willing to buy a place at a much higher price than it can possibly be worth just because there was a widow involved in it. In the summertime, Douglas had a very, very fine variety of great artists coming here. And um, Hall Kane made it a habit to have Sunday tea for them here at Griba. And he also, I have been told by the family at the time, told the other Manx guests that they under no circumstances should ask the artists to perform. But sometimes they did, of course, they did, they sang and they played the piano and so on. But he had given strict instructions that they came here not to perform and uh, that was appreciated. He said himself that he very often wrote in bed in the early mornings and then he said he liked walking thinking about his book and then he put together the next Piece. But he also spent considerable time doing his writing in a little building up the hill, a very steep hill, his study. And uh, that was his workroom. It was a very cosy place and it had 
photographs, signed photographs from various famous people and books and dedication of this and dedication of that to Hall Kane. And uh, there was also then a runway up to it, so you could get a carriage or a car up to the study. But nowadays, I'm afraid, there is nothing but the four bare walls. It's nothing telling you what it looked like. T.A. Brown, who was not feeling very well, had walked from his Ramsey house across the mountains to here to spend a full day with Hall Kane. They really were very close friends, and he'd also said to Hall Kane, I may not be here when you come back. But uh, Hall Kane thought he meant that he had gone back to Clifton for a visit or something, which he did. It's after all at Clifton that uh, T. Brown died. <laughs>